2021, and we were all looking forward to going to the Kid Elevens Great Ocean Road Race to celebrate the 10 year anniversary of the biggest event in the history of Australian cycling, when Kid Elevens became the first and so far the only Australian to have won the tour. So let's catch up with him over in Europe as he looks back across the 10 years and that victory from 2011. Kid El, welcome to your own show. <laughs> well, thank you, Matt. Thanks, thanks for joining us, everyone, and I hope everyone's staying well. I'm over here on the other side of the world, a world away. I um, wouldn't mind being over there now, that's for sure. But uh, anyway, little little children in quarantine and bits and pieces, it's uh, a little bit easier said than done. But anyway, thank you very much for having me. We're definitely going to touch on quarantine and how you dealt with that and the lockdown because everybody's had their exercise regimes. But firstly, this time 10 years ago, what was your pre-season like? What were you doing at this point of the season? Uh, actually, I'm, I'm in Europe now I'm for different reasons now than I was then, of course. But uh, I actually spent the 2010 off-season. I stayed in Europe. And so I trained in the winter. I was doing, as I'm going to do today, go out for a ride in the cold, probably be back about sunset and because um, it's uh, the days are sh so short at this time of year over here. It was the first time I'd done that. Um, <clears throat> But obviously, I was a lot more focused. My my life was organised around my training, and um, at this time of year, I um, I was um, heavy doing. My main focus was being consistent with the core training and off the bike exercises. I worked with a physiotherapist who I did sort of one on one core and strength dynamic training, and as much for injury prevention and um, as as strength and uh, increasing efficiency. But, um, and then of course building up the time uh, on the bike and the intensity and so on. I think the first race I did uh, in 2011 was, um, I started racing quite late that year because of course we were focusing on the Giro, uh, just the tour that year. And um, I think it was uh, one of the one day races in Italy, Giro del Friuli or something in February. How did it feel different apart from the cold, the fact that you spent the off season in Europe? Did it change your mindset at all? One thing that I really found, um, I didn't think I'd like it at all, and um, but I, what I did really like about it was it was really peaceful. Um, and I still have this same thing today. You go out on a day of bad weather, there's no one around, there's no one to bother you, there's no one to waste your time, you go and do your training, it's cold, you have to dress well, but <laughs> you're in, com in, in my mind, I'm in complete calm because there's no one to... You, everyone just leaves you alone and and that's what I really found that year it was really quite relaxing and um, one thing being an Australian always coming back to Australia in the summer was um, in the end I had like a 20 15 years of continuous summer which sounds really nice but for your body but also for your mindset when we're in summer the days are longer we sleep less everyone's on summer holidays so they're all excited and come and do this come and do that it's actually quite tiring. So winter, what I'm finding now, and being here particularly this year, it's uh, really quite peaceful, relaxful, relaxing. The nights are so long, you sleep very well because it's cold and dark and so on. And and, um, and that's also, that helped me in the 2011 season and what I find now today. And, you know, we always have to look for the, 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 the good aspects of any situation you're in. And um, that's, where I, that's where I look at um, <clears throat> still today. So 10 years ago throughout that, pre-season, did your legs feel any different to any other year? Were you training and thinking, this could be a pretty big year? Uh, in 2010, we'd had a really good year. 2010 was my first year with BMC and just we were just a bit unlucky. I took the pink jersey, I was riding the rainbow jersey uh, in the 2010. I took the pink jersey in the Giro <clears throat> and I was really in a position to really, I was going, going for it to win it. I woke up one morning, I was 39 something degrees fever. The team doctor told me to go home. I said, oh, I, I think I was second on GC. It was the day where um, Richie Port went in that big break and Vinokurov left 40 guys up the road. Um, that was the morning. I, I was 39 degrees uh, fever, 280k stage or something, rain, snow, hail. Um, <clears throat> And um, I ended up fifth in that Giro, but I, I felt like I was really there to to go good. And then uh, in the tour, I had a small crash, 
didn't think much of it. <clears throat> At the start of the stage in the Jura, I was two minutes up on Contador overall after the cobbled stage. Um, <clears throat> and um, I rode into the yellow jersey with a sore elbow. The next day was a rest day, went and had my elbow x-rayed and I had a small fracture in it. So I'd broken my arm and taken the yellow jersey. It was to me also one of those ones that really could have been. So 2010, it wasn't like I wasn't was so far away. Of course, on the results sheet, I was far away, but in what I knew what I could do and how close I was to being able to win either or both of those tours was um, was uh, probably gave me a lot of confidence going to 2011 and then going into 2011 it was just like well let's just avoid the problems and we had a better team more focused team and better better riders to support me in the Grand Tour and also we um, from the outset we'd been planning for the tour whereas because i'd come into the bmc team late the planning and so it wasn't wasn't dedicated uh completely to the tour we were, we were a wild card to the tour in 2010 funnily enough <clears throat> Having a rainbow jersey as the world champion helps get a wild card invitation to the tour. <coughs> it doesn't hurt. It um, doesn't hurt at all. Taking away the disappointment of that tour, though, in 2010 and the fracture that you did have to your arm, was that in some respects a little bit of a blessing because it meant that a lot of people in the media had written you off and figured, let's leave him alone this preseason. He's not one of the guys to talk to. Uh, a, a lot and one thing I remember going, I think I'd come back from Torino Adriatico which we'd won and um, a friend had uh, placed a bet on me and I thought oh, off to, to win the tour, I'm like oh you're keen and then I was like that's not such a bad idea, I wonder what my odds are and I was like 27 to 1. 27 to 1. If something doesn't go wrong, there's no way I'm not getting on the podium at the tour this year. And I thought, well, that's not, that's pretty good odds. <laughs> I suppose when you win it, I don't know how much money this person put on me. But um, yeah, I was really uh, disregarded by the media. And even as uh, I remember being um, being uh, criticized by um, other team managers and things that we got a wild card place. Let's just remember, it was the first rider who could ride for GC at a Grand Tour who had won the Rainbow jersey since uh, Greg LeMond. So um, it was kind of something unique and special for the Tour and and just the fact that um, the Tour likes to be international, to have an English speaker and so on. It's always something for them that's, that's important. And um, yeah, to be criticised by the teams that were not, not a worthy team or I wasn't a, a GC rider anymore or this was just like whatever. But anyway, just let them let them talk. We went away and did our work, which was also thanks to the team, thanks to the people within the team, John Lalang, the team director, the confidence the riders and the team had in me. They just let me go away, do what I needed to do. And um, and then when, the, when, it, when it came down, we, we could um, pull it all together. I must say, it's a pretty harsh critic who says that a guy who's finished twice second at the Tour de France and wears the rainbow jersey isn't deserving of a wildcard invitation to the Tour. It was the uh, French team manager of the, um, I think it was Soy Soy Sun, the team was called then. Yeah. Um, yep. Actually, I think, I think I might have even raced against him when I was really young, actually. I, I can't remember. I can't remember his name now, but it was because if we weren't given a wild card, they may have got it. But it's kind of like, hang on a second, George Hinkapeak at L. Evans, <laughs> um, there's Rainbow there's Jersey. Guys, maybe maybe a rider who can get in a break one day for a bit. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the developments in cycling that happened late in your career, and it's really taken off now, is Strava and the ability to track all your kilometres, compare yourself against the pros. But one of the most impressive elements is the artwork. Have you seen the Strava ride in Geelong with your name? I have, I have, I've seen that and thanks to thanks to social media keeping me informed but um, it's incredible what can, what people do and, and the extent that they go to, it's really, I'm, I'm impressed, I'm very impressed. My, my, Strava, were... my Strava maps don't look anything neat as, like, neat as that. <laughs> last, time, last time we spoke about Strava, my <laughs> My Strava map looked like, um, um, funny, I'm looking at some real estate there and I've gone to check out all the mountain bike single track in the area. <clears throat> and you might have been restricted in how far you could travel so you were going around in circles. There was a lot of people in Melbourne in lockdown that tried to do every road and every little bike path within their five kilometre radius. That uh, completely understandable. I understood in Chamonix when they had the um, lockdown, the the runners in the Mont Blanc Chamonix, it's all the ultra marathoning area. Was um, the police would check uh, check the run people's GPS 
watches to see how long they'd been out so because they had, for the time limit it was um yeah anyway and you know as a professional athlete you have problems with athletes whereabouts because you don't know where you're going to be or where you're going to be and then here we are being logged and tracked uh, everywhere around the world for everything we do one of the great things about the cat 11's great ocean road race is that a lot of the riders in the race they do record it on Strava and they post it. And then for the rest of us who aren't professional cyclists, we can go out there and compare ourselves against the riders. That's one of the great things about this event and about cycling. And I think what's, what is what is amazing there, it just gives you an idea of how fast the guys are going. Because of course, when you see the race and you, you, um, you're watching, oh yeah, they're going pretty fast. And the thing, I, the comment I always heard as a cyclist is, I can't believe how someone's fir first visit to the Tour de France or the Great Ocean Road Race or whatever. I can't believe how fast they ride. I can't believe how small the athletes are. And I can't believe how close they ride together. The people are always impressed. First time visitors to a, to an, a high level bike race. Um, one thing to remember though, um, for comparing yourself to Strava and things, just remember that um, the riders are professionals, full-time professionals, trained for this. The roads are closed. There's no public vehicles, so they're taking the race line, they've got the whole road, and they've got the peloton or their team leading them out for the bottom of a climb or something. So don't, so just remember this, if you, if you do compare yourself to a Strava time, that that, that time up Alpe d'Huez or the time up Shalambra or, <clears throat> always compare apples to apples, which is um, one thing to, I, th I think you should just be a bit careful on Strava with. I personally, I use Strava to compare myself. I think one great thing about Strava is you go, you go and ride a climb and it goes back through for as long as you've been recording and it compares your time, uh, the date and everything, the temperature of every time you've ride, ridden up that climb, which I find quite remarkable. So, oh, how come I was so fit six months ago or, or whatever? Oh, that's right, it was summer and there was no ice on the trail or something like that in the case of where I am right now but um but the um there are other aspects of Strava where <clears throat> it happens less and less now if you're comparing yourself into a race obviously it's a race situation one thing I remember right when Strava being used to start I was sitting uh, pro cycling team dinner table discussion Manuel Quincy Arthur explaining to me there's this Strava section in my house and I just can't get it I just can't get it and he was telling me how his coach was motor pacing him on his time trial bike on a section on this uh, road out from um, Bolzano where he lives and um, motor pacing on his time trial bike in 2012 I remember it because it was his last hit out before the world time trial championships he still couldn't get this Strava section and he was actually quite frustrated about it and this is 2012 the next week he went and won the world team time trial championships <laughs> he didn't get this Strava section that always made me think I don't know if I ever want to compare myself to Strava times because there's something that's not quite right since then of course there's lots more uh, um, if there's something in this case how could someone who's just in world championship winning form being motor paced which is actually cheating right for Strava um, <laughs> not, not get a Strava time the, the, if someone put a Strava time because the bike was on the roof of their car or something I think but anyway anyway it's, that's that's kind of eliminated now from what I understand but always something just to be aware of when you you made a good point though about not comparing yourself to others, but you used it to compare yourself against yourself. I saw a really good quote recently from Ray Lewis, and it says, wins and losses come a dime in a dozen, but effort, nobody can judge effort. Effort is between you and you. I think that's a, a perfect, uh, I think that's a great mentality. I had this thing and I applied to my own professional career, um, I think that's a great mentality to have. And I was taught this when I was on the national team with uh, John Gregory back in the mountain bike national team in the 90s. And he always said, um, always giving your best. And from him, I learned it's more important. Compare yourself to giving your best because maybe you're racing, especially in elite racing. Maybe you're racing against a cheat. Maybe you're trying to get a Strava time with someone who was motor pacing. Or, but if you've done way better than or 102% of your maximum possibility, so you've done a great effort, but don't you? But then you demoralise because you got beaten. But hang on a second, if you're racing against a motorbike or 
<laughs> you're never going to beat it anyway. So, so why sort of demoralise it? Compare what 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 your best is, and well, if you only did 98% of your best, <clears throat> you can do better. If you did 100% of your best, well, you can't do better, and that's the best you can do, and, and be satisfied with that. And that's where I think um, my my own personal useless Strava is to compare against myself. Also, I'm probably a little a little a lot different than people. Most people who use Strava, whereas I'm, my best times are behind me on, on Strava. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be able to beat them anyway. So, so my Strava is only telling me that I'm getting worse. Um, but um, for a lot of people, it's 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 great motivation. I think to be able to compare their improvement, especially if you're new to the sport and someone can come to the sport new at our age, so it's 40 plus. And if you're starting now, you're gonna you're gonna you've got a certain window of time to improve. If, like me, you've been a full-time professional for 20 years and you're not anymore, you're probably not going to get to the same level. <laughs> One of the other fun elements of it is, is actually the exact opposite of what we were talking about then. It is comparing yourself to others. And the beauty of having the Kid 11's Great Ocean Road Race where it is, is the best pros in the world go for recovery rides. And there is a segment that is called Big Hill and it's coming out of lawn, heading back towards Anglesey. In 2019, a young Tade Pogacar, before he'd won the Tour de France, was on a nice, easy recovery ride. And I found his Strava time, Cadell, and I <laughs> beat the winner of last year's Tour de France. And at 46 years of age, I might be ready to go in July. <laughs> um, well, they've got an Australian manager in that team now, so maybe you should give him a call. Uh, <laughs> maybe they'll have a place for you. <laughs> There, there are those aspects to it, and I, I have to say one one thing about like he'd be riding. I don't think Pogacar is probably probably looking at all the times that are behind him, but that's where I think as a as a pro you're sort of like you don't ride fast every day, or actually your best as we saw he did in his time trial on uh, Planche de Belfi last year in the Tour. His best ride was then. Is that on Strava? I didn't check, but maybe I should. But, um, but also, that's one thing about also training well is ride slow when you meet the ride slow so that when you have to ride really fast, that's probably a perfect example. No disrespect, mate. You're doing great, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. His heart rate was probably 105. Mine was about 185 and I was just out by the red zone. But yeah, <laughs> well, at 26 sure. age, if you can still get your heart rate that high, you're doing really good. I was pretty happy. My head almost blew off at the top of the hill. You made a really good point though about one of the mistakes a lot of us non-professional cyclists make is our easy days aren't easy enough, which then stops our hard days from actually being hard enough. Yeah, that's um, because well, it used to be, be Strava is still a little bit like this, and it used to be um, people have this fixation, and this is a real Australian cycling mentality. How many Ks do you do a week? Do more Ks, do more Ks. I think doing Ks, the more you do, the less fresh you are to do them fast, so the slower that you do them. So you get really good at doing kilometres slowly, but if you want to be a good racer, you've got to go fast. And that's where I was riding along, actually it was in the people's ride with um, Darren Bourne one day, and he said, um, you can't believe Swift has transformed Grand Fondos. No, really? Why? Um, well, because all of a sudden people are doing all this really good specific training on their on their Zwift trainer, and so when they come to a public ride, they're actually rather than doing long, slow kilometres, which for some reason people think that makes you a great bike rider, it um, it's no, you're better off doing doing short hit outs at high speed, like like you do on a trainer in Zwift, which is actually this perfect training. We've got the Kid 11's Great Ocean Road Race Strava Club, so we're trying to encourage people mainly to get out and ride and compare themselves to themselves. When you're down in Bowen Heads in your home in Australia, which are your favourite sections to ride? My favourites of all sections, well, I always ride along 13th Beach because I love the view and it's um, one of the, it's the least traffic road to get to my house in Bowen Heads. Of course, that's a bit of a, uh, a, a given. Um, I love riding, um, I find like when you go from if there's a good training, I, I, my, my most training was done on the hills in series for my preparation for my season. It's still become quite built up out there, so it's actually quite a lot of traffic now and even to compare, I've got too many phones on here. Um, 
So even to compare um, Strava times, there's now roundabouts and they made a cutting across where the fire pass is. Um, I probably can't compare times there, um, but the, the climb out to series, I did a lot of my training there. And then um, I love riding everywhere from Torquay onwards down the Great Ocean Road and the further you go, the, the more beautiful it becomes. It is a beautiful part of the world. I am going to join that Strava club and I'm going to see if I can pinch a few of the King of the Mountains points along that climb that's scattered throughout the Great Ocean Road. So if you could turn the clock back and put yourself in that pressure position and get your teammates to drop you off in the right spot, what's the one race you wish you had of one that you didn't win? Uh... Watching the, the whole Pogacar and, and Roglic uh, tour this year and, and I can imagine what was going through um, Roglic's head in that time trial, what was going on. And, um, and I'm guessing I'm guessing they made a rushed yellow helmet that they made in the wrong size as well. That probably didn't help, but anyway, without diverting too far from the point. Um, seeing seeing Rogla win Liège, that was one race that I really would have been like, oh, that's one I really would have liked to have been able to perform better on in my career. Um, if not Liège, to Lombardy as well, because I'm still um, based near there and it's a little bit, it's a race close by, but um, yeah, Liège was the time of the season and the distance to be good for that, we would have had to compromise um, what I did in the state races and towards the tour and Lombardia. <laughs> Some years I was starting in um, Tour Down Under <laughs> in January in Australia, or not being very fit at the Nationals in January, but I'm on the start line and they're expecting me to win at Lombardia in October. And <laughs> hang on a second. <laughs> I often got to Lombardia very tight. Uh, Liège is one of my favourite races to commentate on for pretty much what you alluded to in that you've got, it's the one one day race where the big Grand Tour contenders go head to head with the Spring Classic specialists. So you see the two style of riders come together on one big day and it's a brutal course. And it's, it's a bit of a crossover of the season because, of course, you're coming at the end of the one day the one day classics and going into a tour of Romandy and my, my training, whether whether I mistimed or something, Romandy was always just like going along, oh, this is good. this is easy. Um, but it is uh, the age, I remember actually when I had a mountain bike teammate before I raced on the road and uh, what's the hardest race you ever did? Oh, Liège based on Liège. So I suppose that always sort of stay with me, but it's it's... It's very, it's it's hard race. It's hilly, and um, yeah, it's just I, I always found it so long. I was fine to two ten, two twenty or something, um, but then just in the final when they did the acceleration. Normally, oh, if I got to La Redoute good, it was already it was already good. But I was from then on, I was always running on empty. But it is a, it is a beautiful race, and as a as a GC rider, you're preparing for the tour, or maybe you've been at. Um, the tour of the bus country and you're watching Paris-Roubaix and Flanders on TV and then to finally come there and be amongst it all it's 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 really quite um oh, the, the one day classics we say Liège I didn't win I would have loved to have ridden a Flanders or a Roubaix or a or a um Milan San Remo was a big race that I didn't ride but um also at a certain point <laughs> I read so many other races it wasn't like I could ride them all not well anyway so given those races that you did miss, what are you looking forward to watching in 2021? Um, 2020, we had a real uh, deprivation. We had, we had our racing in February, which was, um, we, we, we had the Great Ocean Road Race and then we, I was sitting having dinner with a friend um, in Australia and, and we made a joke about, oh, this coronavirus, let's see what happens. And we sort of just laughed about it. <laughs> <laughs> we, we laughed about it. it was really it was the first thing where um like who would think that we're, we're not going to catch up in europe and uh, anyway that's a, that's a, almost a year ago now um then we had a break from everything and of course our everyone's lives changed the world changed and then um, the first race back was strada bianca and as a fan of cycling me, Steffi, we packed up the bike. I packed up Steffi's e-bike, the bike trailer, and we went and rode the. We rode three or four times the the biggest section there of Strada Bianca. We stayed in a hotel by the course, and 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 we went down as a family and stood on the side of the road and watched watched Strada Bianca. And that was really um, that was the first time I'd actually gone a long way to a race to to watch as a fan. To be honest, normally I go there for work reasons or to meet with someone or. Or do something and, and and enjoy the race at the same time. But uh, this time was was just to watch a race, and so I'll, I'll look forward to that. And I'd probably love to go back and, and visit that again if if if, if I can. Um, then of course uh, the tour, Pogacar, um, 
Pogba attempting to repeat. Bernal, will he come back? And honestly, I think um, I think Richie's going to be in a really good position this year, to be honest. I'm looking forward to seeing what he can do at the Tour and the change of teams back to Ineos and who gets to play what role. But I'm really intrigued by the fact that you and Steffi, you went and stood by the side of the road and you were a spectator like anybody else. Did it change your perspective on cycling and what you did as a bike rider? Uh, oh, certainly. And that was uh, stopping and becoming a race organiser for the Great Ocean Road Race. Was What's been really interesting is um, I had 20 years of my life focused within the barriers sport, performance, equipment. <laughs> okay, this is the start time. Everything from then is matters. And at the finish line, well, that sort of dictates the next few days, weeks of your life. Um, and everything was focused on that. And then, funnily enough, my last race, the 2015 Great Ocean Road Race, was my first race as a race organiser, my last race as a professional cyclist. So all of a sudden I'm becoming involved in outside the barriers and road closures and course details and changing course routes, looking to what appeals to the public, what would be interesting racing, everything outside of the barriers going through the risk assessments and so on this year coronavirus and all these things you just there's just so much so many things that can go wrong at the same time i was started in the bike industry in my role at bmc learning everything about outside of the racing and equipment outside of racing which has also been from my part very interesting because all my life i've been riding bikes and so often i've got a bike or had a bike and why do they do this why do they do that and then to to go into the hows whys and and how it all comes together behind the scenes and and why these decisions are made why is the seat collar that thickness there and that color there or, or um it's all for a reason and, and and it's been really interesting learning that going as a spectator same thing standing on the side of the road seeing it race organizer had on mentality it's um oh yeah we're, i'm always learning still i'm always learning the one thing i learned throughout 2020 particularly when you saw so many sporting events with empty stadiums and bike races without any spectators by the side of the road was, was coffee, right? the role that spectators play the supporters are the most important element of any sport. A sporting venue empty with no atmosphere is a dull sporting event. And sometimes we complain about spectators at the Tour de France getting too close to the riders, but it just sets the event apart having spectators by the side of the road. I think um, soccer was a real um, a great, or a, not, not, not a great example for them, unfortunately, because they're playing an empty stadium. It was an example of how much that adds to the match. The um, the uh, attitude of the players. Um, they The players found it really hard to play in empty stadiums. Um, having gone back to, I remember leading the um, mountain bike race at the Sydney Olympics, and I'm in some back section of the course out at Farfield, and there was a guy standing, there was a, some Aussie guy standing on the side of the road, keep going, mate. <laughs> It was like I was leading the Olympic Games. I was sort of like, <laughs> put me off my concentration a bit. I'm <laughs> leading this huge race and I was in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, well, I wasn't going to stop. But, <laughs> but it <laughs> changes the idea. And then you go to, um, say, the World Championships uh, on the road. Um, in particular, I always have this idea when you're in for the, for the win, the last climb of the World Championships, I remember being in Stuttgart with Bettini. Um, and there was one other one that really stood out in my mind, not Mendrisio, because everyone was silent on the last climb there, um, when I went up there anyway. Um, there was one other climb, and I just it just struck me as a, you could not hear yourself think for the intensity of the yelling and the cheering, and it was it was it was like being uh, in front of that massive uh, speaker at a like a Pearl Jam or U2 concert or something, and um, and so uh, that was. And in cycling thing, I think the really the really big stage at the tour you have um, many so many people and you do 120 k stage. I remember we had a stage once in uh, Switzerland, uh, the stage of Verbier in 2009 that Con Contador won. Um, we're riding and riding and riding. I'm like, I've got to stop and go to the toilet, but there's not one meter without spectators and then there was a bridge and actually it was, it was Lance's tour he came back and the, Lance and his team stopped under the bridge or one he's got his team and I'm also going to stop there because it was, it was under a bridge and people couldn't access it so you could actually go to the toilet but of course in 50 60 kilometers it doesn't normally happen but there the crowds are incredible um Alpe d'Huez of course there's a couple of sections that get a bit 
dangerous. Um, when you're going up up the west in the Grappetto, yes, that the Dutch corner or something, that was a bit, mm, I'd rather not have a beer bottle broken uh, over me, but, um, but, but for the most part, it's exciting, sometimes dangerous, but that's, that's the tour. It is indeed. So a few lighter questions now. We're going to kick it off with, what's the one sporting event that you would daydream about winning that's not bike racing? Uh, Bathurst. Uh, I love the V8s. So. If you could have only one bike for the rest of your life, what would it be? Road bike, mountain bike, gravel bike, cyclocross, or a town bike? I've spent so much time exploring, changing, fiddling with, and I'm gonna go out and ride in a couple of hours, my gravel bike. We Come all, on. yeah, go on. I love it, but it's, for me, it's a little bit, it's an all road bike. It's not, it's for all roads. It's not for gravel. Mine, mine's an all road bike, but it's, um, I think it's a little bit road cycling, but maybe like 30, 40 years ago where you're riding, not all the roads are asphalted and, and no, but uh, um, I, and I was just thinking to myself, well, this is what I do exactly if I gravel. Yeah, it's the Swiss army knife of bikes. You can absolutely take it anywhere. So we've all experienced having punches out on the road or on the gravel or on a mountain bike. Are you a CO2 canister or an old fashioned hand pump kind of guy? In Australia, I carry both because in Australia you puncture so often. Um, living down on the Great Ocean Road, there's a lot of ho- it's a lot of holiday period. There's a lot of broken glass on the side of the road, so there's a lot of punctures. Um, so I carry a pump uh, as well as CO2. Then depending on the time and where I, where I need to be and things, whether I use the pump or, or a CO2. Uh, training in Europe, I um, training in Europe is funny. The roads are so clean. Uh, when I first moved to Europe uh, to be based here many years ago, I remember um, the first puncture I got, the valve fell out of the tube because the roads are so good, you never ever change the tube. So the tubes actually kind of wear out. <laughs> It's kind of it wasn't something I was used to living in Australia. So I carry CO2s because you really, uh, you re- actually really puncture living here. We said that I'm going out for a ride now, so I've got to check off, got yeah. everything. But and touch them wood to make sure you don't punch it. So as a, as a as a father once again, you've got a relatively young one. Dirty nappy or change a puncture? If you had to choose between one, which would it be? Yesterday I did about uh, 10 nappies. <clears throat> We've got a two-year-old and a three-month-old. So <laughs> nappies we, we do quite a lot of. Nappies anytime. Uh, particularly now we're going to the tube, no tube with the lip on the rim. <laughs> Fitting on some of the tires is so tight now that it's um, it seems to be getting more and more, more and more um, difficult to do. So no, nappy anytime over changing the puncture. Okay, what weight were you when you won the Tour de France and how much do you weigh now? I think I raced the Tour uh, 67.5. Haven't weighed myself recently, but I guess I'd be 71 or 72 kilos. I am heavier, but um, I can move furniture because I have shoulders now. That's the, that's the big difference. I have a lot more, I have a lot more uh, muscle than I did when I was a bike rider. As a bike rider, especially an endurance athlete, you're very uh, catabolic often. So anything that's not for pedaling a bike, you actually burn off. Now, because I don't ride nearly as much, but carrying babies and things, um, you actually get a chance to build, well, I won't say, I'll say build some muscle as opposed to, as opposed to none. So we've ticked off the box that we know you do plenty of running. We know you're still doing some riding. What else do you do to stay fit, juggling family life and so on? Yeah, um, I, I took up running when I stopped racing just to fit in with the travel and, and time. And of course, as a professional rider, your life is designed or organized around your training. Of course, now training or exercise comes in like everyone, about 99% of the people in the world exercise comes in all around the rest of your life yes i do run a lot i um i didn't get out this morning it was it was, it was zero degrees this morning at sunrise so i said like i can wait it's going to be 10 degrees in the afternoon so today's ride day but i'll go running tomorrow morning i still do quite a bit of the um strength and con- not strength and conditioning um postural well-being that I I learned as a rider, but more for health and well-being in the morning. So I did some stretches and stuff this morning, but that's just for um, corrective from many years, (laughs) hunched over on a bike and um, just uh, as a habit of waking up in the morning. So I do a little bit of sort of yoga and stretching and things as well. Beautiful way. That's it. Beautiful way to start the day. We've now got three 
fan question to ask Cadell. This first one comes from DG. How has the transition been from being a pro rider to this new type of normal? <laughs> new type of normal in the pandemic or new type of normal? I um, had my, as a pro rider, of course, my focus was my training, my racing, but I had a lot of things going on outside of the racing already. So, and I remember sitting down with um, Jason Backer, in Australia, my manager, so oh, it's going to be really good when I stop racing. I'm actually going to have time to do this other stuff properly and coming on, organizing a race and so on. I had so much stuff going on in my life that my transition wasn't that hard to make because my, my time was filled in. The void that was, the void was disappeared quickly because I had so much stuff, so many other things going on in my life. Um, I, one thing that I had to adapt to was as a, as a rider, you sort of get a bit used to maybe take for granted that I have to go and train. People go and let you train. Oh, that's your job. Go and do it. As a non-professional, oh, I want to go and ride my bike. And that's something <laughs> people don't let you go and do it. So that, that was something I had to get, had to get used to and still sometimes a little bit have to. But today the situation is uh, testing some things on a gravel bike for BMC, the sun shining and having some something done in the house. So I have to be out because of the thing. So, oh, well, that's good. And, and the sun shining today. I'm, I'm in winter, so sun. you go out when the sun is shining. You've got to make the most of those rare opportunities. Ask it, Al. Next question. This one is from Todd Knight. What did you do during lockdown? <laughs> Todd, uh, a friend of mine. Um, uh, what did I do? The same as I always did, but I didn't travel anywhere. Um, we've got two small children, and one thing that, um, that they've taught me is to be a present parent. Um, it does take its time, doesn't it? As much time as you have to give them, you they, they can they can take, but that's been fantastic. Um, and I had my most regular exercise training, if you want to call it that, at the start, the real lockdown we had at the start. I had this beautiful graph of just beautiful progressive training and build up in form. It was incredible. So I um, exercised and stayed with my kids and stayed with Steffi. We're, 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 we're just two here. We've got two small children who need a lot of hands on. So we're <laughs> that, that, that was that was pretty much it. And I'll work, but all via virtual. I think a lot of people made the most of that opportunity to actually spend more time at home with their family, particularly for somebody like you who spent so much of his life traveling. It was probably um, nine. I, yeah, I've averaged for 20 years, 40 something, fly, 45 flights a year. And some of them are really long flights. It's one year since I've been, I went to the airport. I, my, my mum came over from Australia and visited us for the birth of the child. Uh, um, Blake, <laughs> that was the only time I've been to the airport was to take someone, take someone there. Um, so that's been bizarre, not to pack a suitcase and not to make a trip. But um, I think I'd like to think a, a lot of people. I'm, I'm not the only one who had a vegetable garden for the first time in a long time, or baked bread or something. Uh, but just those little things. But I'd like to think that some of those things are going to stay with us um, from this whole lockdown and working within the bike industry. Um, a lot of people. Are buying bikes in this period as well. Yeah, it has been referred to buying a bike as the new toilet paper. <laughs> uh, <laughs> ask it, Al, and this is the final question. It's a simple one. This is from Velo Cyclism. Who will be the next Australian to win the Tour de France? Well, um, like I was referred to earlier, I think uh, Richie's in a great place and he's, well, he's, he, he, he's in a, time isn't on his side in terms of age, but um, going back to the team and for him, I think that's a, a good position to be in. And he's gone back to Australia and he's training freely and everyone else is about to go in uh, lockdown actually in Europe here. So we'll may, may, maybe, maybe in lockdown again soon. So that's going to put him in a, a good position to prepare well for the season. Um, beyond that, um, riders to watch, um, well, Jai Hindley, obviously his performance at the Giro would be interesting if he, I assume he, he would want to try and replicate that in the tour. Um, let's give him some time because it's um, to, it's a it's a big step from the Giro to the to the Tour, um, but let's give him some time and then um, um, Jack Haig's still always an interesting rider. I think if he was given some opportunities, he could uh, do something for GC. Whether he could win the Tour or not, maybe he would have shown something earlier. But if I had to, if I had to bet on, I'd say Jai Hindley showing the most 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 promise at the moment. Well, second in Giro at his age, 24 or 25, it's a pretty good start. And you know the transition from that race across to the Tour. Yeah, oh, yeah it's kind of the same, but 
a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> Cadell, thanks for your time. 10 years on from the pre-season that led to the biggest moment in your career. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone. And please, so I think in Australia, you're all doing well. I'm looking at the numbers and things and following the news, of course, but um, stay well over there. You've done a fantastic job in sort of not quite eradicating it, but you're light years ahead of where we are on this side of the world. So keep up the great work, everyone there in Australia and stay healthy.